thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this invitation. When I got invited, uh, first thing I did was Googling a media scene. I found nothing. <laughs> Only your homepage. And that, that is really rare. It's, uh, so it's. Oh, okay, I've, I had one. I, okay, then I, there were two. But it's, it's quite rare. And, and uh, yeah, we should respect that. It's, uh, it's the creation of terms uh, really important for. Uh, starting a new approach, and so that is really singular. And I'm really glad to be here again, where well, so much started, like our MVD group, and so on, and so on. I have no presentation because I have very, uh, a very simple uh, paper with three sections: uh, beginning, middle section, and an end. <laughs> Three years ago, the Journal of Media and Cultural Research, the Zeitschrift für Media und Kulturforschung, printed in Hamburg but edited here in Weimar, turned to the Anthropocene in its debate section. Christian Schwergal and Reinhold Leinfelder started the debate off with their contribution, The Man Made Earth. On the first three pages, they demonstrate the epochal impact on human activity on the Earth that was uh, always met, uh, already mentioned by you, Hans Engel. The impact of human activity on Earth referring to many facts and stats. Schwegel and Leinfelder speak of the Anthropocene as an age in the geological sense, which distinguishes itself from other ages like the Holocene, Pleistocene, or Pliocene, and so on, because mankind has developed geohistorical impact and appears as a significant and sometimes dominating environmental force, which, is, which it is referred to frequently since the 1980s based on the work of Krusen and Sturmer. In their article, Schwegel and Leinfelder assert, I quote, a man deposits more than 30 times more sediment and rock through agriculture and building activity than it was the case in the past 500 million years without his intervention. He transforms entire water systems and dries up the interior, interior of the Aral Sea. All this and much more are phenomena that could still be demonstrated stratigraphically the thousands of years in the future. Bruno Latour has also quoted Krusen in his Gifford lectures given in Edinburgh in 2013 and has given a series of examples of geohistorical forces made by man, which shows that for the first time humans have to be regarded as the most important agent of sustainable change. However, in these contributions to the Anthropocene, it is also mentioned that it cannot be humans alone who, in their anthropological imperfection, have begun the epochal change, but man as part of a global network whose agents not only include human beings as deficient creatures, but also tools, machinery, cultural techniques, and media. Very true. For how could man possibly change the climate on his own? It is typical of the discourse of the Anthropocene to find contributions such as the one of Schwegel and Leinfelder, though it is titled The Man Made, the Man -Made Earth, which indicate that man cannot be made accountable for problems such as climate change. A problematic Anthropocene should be avoided anyway, Schwegel and Leinfelder add. Thus, the Anthropocene should not be misunderstood as the age of man, they conclude. Agreed. But what is the meaning of this epoch then? Schwegel and Leinfelder list novel hybrids and fusions from creatures and technical objects whose shared agency leaves those traces on Earth which, according to geologists, make epochs. As Eva Horn rightly remarked recently, contrary to the term terminology of classical ecology, which is based on the clear separation of the organism and the environment, of culture and nature, the concept of the Anthropocene is concerned to challenge this separation as such. 
This observation also applies to Schwegel and Leinfelder. Our machines, they note, are in this perspective inhabitants of the Earth, which somehow have to fit into its metabolism. As Latour similarly mentioned in his Facing Gaia lecture, I quote, humans are pretty bad candidates to play the role of the Anthropos, of the Anthropocene. This role actually is played by actor networks consisting of countless human and non-human agents. Man alone does not create an epoch, but humans do as an integral part of the Earth system in interaction with other actors such as machines, technologies, and media. According to Schweger and Leinfelder, the Anthropocene includes steamers and ammonia reactors, but also satellites, computers, and the internet. Considering that humans only create a geohistorical epoch as parts of a hybrid socio-technical ensemble or as an element of an actor network, it can be argued that the Anthropocene of Schwegel and Leinfelder might as well be called Mediocene and their article should be titled Media Made Earth. Schwegel and Leinfelder describe the nature, culture, technology, society. This is in German one word, a mere string of substantives connected with hyphens, also nature, culture, technology, society. This is an interacting overall concept, uh, is concepted as an interacting overall system. And at least the introductory sentences by the organizers of this conference of the concept of the media scene could as well be taken directly from them. The concept is published on the media scene homepage. I googled. Sees media and medial processes as epoch making, as a determining force. They leave their permanent imprint on the world affecting animate and inanimate nature alike, human existence, technology, society, and the arts, as well as the shape, organization, and history of the global habitat itself. Quote uh, Anne. At this point, I would like to introduce my own statement on the media scene. I would like to argue that from a certain perspective on humans and the media, there is no difference between the Anthropocene and the media scene. All the conceivable differences become irrelevant when humans are not thought of as one side of a great dualism of nature and culture or biological alive and technically created, but as one agent in an association with many other agents who collectively constitute the media scene in the sense of a hybrid mode consisting of a recursive entanglement. For this perspective, some authors, which played a significant role for the history of media sciences, can be identified as exemplary precursors. On the way to a media economic view of man, even of life, as the Weimar concept of the media scene explicates, the media anthropological view of the recursive entanglement, entanglement of man and media is an important point. I will take on this concept very briefly in order to address an early vision of a media scene which has been presented in the 1860s 60s of the 19th century in the second part of my paper. And if you have read the program, it's Samuel Butler. And now I uh, recollect one or two uh, pages in Deleuze and Gattari's uh, uh, anti -Ulip on on Butler. And they, they, I think I were really ex exploring something what you, what you uh, showed us from, even from Butler, I, thought I had some, uh, some analogies to, uh, um, to that. Okay, but I, I have not explored that. <laughs> the media scene manifesto states, life itself is short circuit with the evolution of technical beings. I would like to compare and contrast this assertion with a Darwinian thesis published in the year 18. 72, which calls the problematic dualisms of nature and culture, biologically alive and technically created, into question as well. The author wonders, who can draw the line? Who can draw any line? Is not everything interwoven with everything? Is not machinery linked with animal life? 
in an infinitive variety of ways. Indeed, the Anthropocene can be described as a media scene if humans are conceived as hybrid beings composed of the biologically living and technically created alike. Approaches to such thinking can be found in the history of media anthropology in the 19th and 17th uh, the 20s, 19th and 20th centuries, for example, in the oeuvres of Ernst Kapp, Sigmund Freud, or Marshall McLuhan, in his essay on the civilization and its discontents, published in 1930, Sigmund Freud states that humankind marvelously changed the earth in which it first appeared as a weak animal and into which every individual of his kind has to step into as a helpless infant through its science and technology by perfecting his motoric and sensory organs such as motors, glasses, microscopes, cameras, gramophones, telephones, but also writing and architecture. He, this infant, changed the earth. I quote, man has, as it were, become a kind of prosthetic god. When he puts on all his auxiliary organs, he's truly magnificent, but those organs have not grown on him and they still give him much trouble at times. By the way, he has a right to console himself with the fact that this development will not be completed by 1913. Distant times will bring about new, probably unimaginably great progress in this field of culture, which will further increase the God-likeness of man. If human beings were to put aside all their auxiliary organs and not even a biface would extend the hand or closing the fur, if no extensions of man, as Marshall McLuhan called, the processes of media of man would compensate natural born human deficiencies as to make life viable, then, to, modif to modify Freud, man would certainly not have stirred anything epochal and rather left nothing that could be demonstrated stratigraphically on this earth. Therefore, the Anthropocene could not be addressed without the tools, machines, and media which Freud calls organs and McLuhan refers to as extensions. For this variant of the organ projection theory, the medium is the message. For Freud, just as McLuhan, does not care exactly what a motor actually moves, what a camera or disc actually records, or what a tool is used for exactly, but he is sure that because of the advance and expansion of the capabilities of man through his increasingly powerful and specialized means and devices, culture is going to make unimaginably great progress, and that he himself will become a prosthetic god. Friedrich Hitler once commented, there is nothing entirely wrong in this mixture of power and powerlessness, sublime and absurdity of man and Freud and McLuhan, but methodologically delicate is the basic assumption that no other than man is the subject of all media. Man is not master of the media. Speaking of McLuhan and Freud, this criticism is spot on and it is even more necessary to point out that an alternative to this natural assumption of Freud and McLuhan had been formulated 100 years before Hitler's criticism. In 1877, the geographer and philosopher Ernst Kapp presented the theory of the co-evolution of man, the media, the environment, and society with his philosophy of technology. The devices which humans use to assert themselves against bloodthirsty preda predators and the struggle for existence are, according to Kapp, projected organs with, which increase the natural power of the arm and hand. The biological evolution that made claws and jaws as tools is supplemented by an evolution of the machines which provide humans with equifunctional weapons and tools. The projections of organs as an evolutionary mechanism cannot escape the advantage of a tool to give the helpless the means he needs for survival and reign in hostile nature, Kapp argues. With the differentiation, specialization, and increase of his means, as mentioned in Freud and McLuhan, the available power of mankind grows. At this point, it should be mentioned, the imperfection of man is increasing too because the dependence of man on his techno-social environment increases with the differentiation, specialization, and development of the human media ecology. 
Cup's theory of organic development states that all elementary practices can be adopted with simple devices of all types of steam-driven machines and can be increased in almost every respect, performance, precision, yield. The steam engine counts as a mother of all legion of working machines of all kinds. Any organ, whether used as a receiver for transmission or as a tool, can be outlined as a stream-driven machine. From a theoretical point of view, it is interesting that Kapp not only understands individual machines or tools as projections of organs, but complex socio-technological socio connections as well, which result from a chain linking of human and non-human organs extending and enhancing the possibilities of human physiology. For Kapp, the media and milieu of man constitute an ecological niche of co-evolution which covers all dimensions of biological, technological and social advancement. The organic change of man, the progress of instruments, tools and media that serve to control and penetrate the outside world, society and it trend its trend towards an increasing labor division and specialization. The theory of organ projection leads Kapp to compare the organs of the human body and its functions with those of the nation state or even the world state. In all this, it would be obvious to think of the organ projections in both directions, that is, not only to understand machines and media as extensions of man, but conversely, to conceive the physiology and the psyche of man as an internalization of machines and media. This is closely related to the conception of our conference host technical operations like signaling and data processing techniques such as copying, messaging, intercepting, cutting up, doubling, seem to constitute an essential part of what is called life. However, Cup did not went as far, but somebody else. What is a man's eye but a machine for the little creature that sits behind his brain to look through? What has man made, what has made man familiar with the scenery of the moon, the spots of the sun, or the geography of the planets? He is at the mercy of the seeing engines for these things and is powerless unless he take it on, he take it on to his own identity and make it part and parcel of himself. The eye is called a machine, conversely telescopes, microscopes from a part of the visual apparatus, optical media and sense organs merge into a higher, higher unity. The passage anticipates Cup's philosophy of technology which regards technical media as continuations of the organism or as a projection of organs and that this relation is based on reciprocal enhancement. In 1872, Samuel Butler's Erevon constructed the theory that every technical invention increases the efficiency of the human body in the sense of an externalization projection. Externalizing projection, sorry. Additionally, and this is Butler's great proposal for the symmetrification of people and the media, our body, together with, with its organ projections, composes a community of limbs. Humans are said to form a collective of physical and external bodies of organs and media. Here, Hitler's critique of the anthropocentrism of the media theories of Freud McLuhan would miss point, for a man is not a prosthetic god, but an agent in a socio-technical net. In the following, I will briefly illustrate the important step from a theory of organ projections to Butler's model, model of a community of limbs. His composition of a community of limbs is, could be depicted in the following. I, I start with some more it sounds more like a projection theory, but then it will be clearly, you will see clearly that it's uh, really different to that. I quote, his memory goes in his pocketbook. Some engines expand his brain. The railway and the telegraph increase the speed and range of his communication. 
The media community that mankind belongs to shapes people socially because media determine the mode of his social organization and its development as a species. The media ensembles and their enhancing effects are said to create new hominid species and subspecies. A person who, for example, can, I quote again, tack on a special train to his identity and go wheresoever he will, whensoever he pleases, is more highly organized than he whose legs are his only means of locomotion. These are not only individual organs transformed into tools, but ensembles that emerge through the attachment, the attachment of machines, techniques, thus through the attachment of media to the human organs and networks. The human subspecies who takes a special train is said to be more highly organized than a man who walks a foot. Media networks not only associate and collectivize, they also stratify and thus serve the formation of different cultures. However, Erevon takes a significant step beyond the anthropocentric theories of organ projection. Humankind not only is a social community due to media, but as long as its organs, bloodstream and nerve cords all consist of infinite living agents. So Butler literally. Man is, according to Butler, a swarm of parasites. It is doubtful whether his body is not more theirs than his. Butler's narrator challenges the asymmetry of man and media. In Erevon, Michel Sayer and Bruno Latour would find an elaborate thesis on the evolutionary advantages of parasitism and networks, which ex expli explicitly includes non-human actors. Machines also explicitly belong to the community of limbs which constitutes man. The distinctions between machinery and man, between the living and the artificial, well established in the 19th century, is brought into question. I quote again, who can pull the divider? Who can pull the partition anywhere? Is not everything interwoven with everything? End of quote. From a human point of view, I quote again, from a human point of view, the text argues the differentiation and sorting that are necessary for established dualisms are easy from a human point of view, but, but the book of the machines continues, but mankind is not everybody. This solutions of the asymmetrical dichotomies of subject and object, master and servant, nature and culture, especially strike the eye when we, as advised in Erevon, observe the agency which connect people, machines, and organisms, and aggregate into higher units. We see combinations everywhere, and I quote Butler and not Latour, which would be ignored or purified only because of epistemological <coughs> comfort, which is why our ignorance remains unbroken. The anthropocentric hybrids, prosthetic God, that man is the lord of the earth and that the tools, machines, and all that is living are only his servants is answered. Quote again, this is all very well, but the servant glides by imperceptible approaches into the master, and we have come to such a pass that we serve the machines. And man's very soul must be called a machine-made thing. And once again, I quote Butler, it is the machine which act upon man and make him man as much as man who has acted upon and made the machines. Man and machine, culture and nature cooperate in the medium of their limbs and organs. Let anyone, I quote again, let anyone examine the wonderful self-regulating and self-adjusting contrivances which are now incorporated with the vapor engine. Let him watch the way in which it supplies itself with oil, in which it indicates its wants to, to those who tend it, in which, by the governor, it regulates its application of the, its own strengths. Let him look at that storehouse of inertia and momentum, the flying wheel. This self-regulation of the machines is a central argument for the assumption that the difference between the life of a man and that of a machine is one rather a degree than of kind. Both man and machine similarly exist and evolve in the mode of feedback loops and in combination with innumerable other agents. From this perspective, mankind can be numbered among the biosphere of machines. 
Butler has described this decentered human agent as a member of a group of parasites. That, 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 that there are three big metaphors, a group of parasites, an element of a machine park, or as a part of a superorganism. In the narrated world of the dystopian novel Erevon, this vision of uh, disempowerment of the godlike man has such a striking success that all machines are destroyed so that man remains the master of the world. The inhabitants of Erevon do not undertake the experiment of a mutually forming a joint actor network with machines and other human agents. According to Foucault, the sciences of man will not awake from the anthropological sleep until they refuse to speak about man, about his reign or his liberation, and when they refuse to think that it is man who is thinking. In this sense, Butler is brought awake. As early as 1863, the 28-year-old sheep farmer expanded the still young evolutionary theory into a visionary theory of the mutual growth of organic, technical, and social orders under the name Darwin among the machines. With the help of the evolutionary theory, Butler detaches his own theory of organ projection, which in many aspects anticipates Cup, Freud, and McLuhan from its anthropological centering and translate it into a hypothesis of a community of limbs constituted of man and machine. When looking at the community of limbs and following the interlinkings of its living and non-living elements, one does not only get to machines, but also to all possible dead and living artificial and natural actors whose networking and cooperation constitutes the media ecology, not only of man, but of the world. To sum up and conclude, first, Butler's narrator states that evolution is a global process that not only involves plants, uh, plants, animals, and humans, but also technologies, machines, and cultures. In this sense, evolution is always co-evolution. The evolution of a species never takes place in a mere isolation, but always together with the community of limbs. Second, Butler conceives the symmetrical integration of man and his socio-technical culture into a global ecology. I quote, the air we breathe is hardly more necessary for our animal life than the use of any machine and the strength of which we have increased our numbers is our civilization. It is the machines which act upon man and make him man as much as man who has acted upon and made the machines. And thirdly, the integration of the machines into man's community of limbs mark an epoch of geological time as the pace of the common evolution of this very network of actors accelerates significantly since machines and media are part of it. With the invention of the steam engine, which, which Schwegel and Leinfelder also consider as an important agent of the Anthropocene, the relative tardiness of the evolution on Earth came to an end. Butler, last, one last time, reflect upon the extraordinary advance which machines have made during the last few hundred years and note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. The more highly organized machines are creatures not so much of yesterday as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with pastime. However, man as a slow element in a community of limbs could hardly be declared as an epochal factor of its own. As Niklas Luhmann highlights in an essay on the problem of epoch formation, there have been, who knows for how long, humans, but they lived, if not peacefully, so at least harmless, if not paradisiacal, so at least without any significant influence on their environment. Only as an associate in a community of machines and parasites, with self-regulating and rapidly evolving media, man becomes epoch-making. Since Butler makes it very clear that mankind is not the master of media ecology of which he is a part of, one must conclude the media scene was first proclaimed in 1872. Of course, nobody heard the call. Butler only was a sheep farmer and Erevon only a novel. And obviously, 
In the fictitious world of Erevon, the media sea never begins because all machines, which are complex like a steam engine, have been destroyed so that man was able to return to his harmlessness and lack of influence. In our world, this has not been the case. Thank you.